past couple years, more Americans have become familiar with the story of the Tulsa Race Massacre, where a white mob burned a vibrant black community to the ground, which is crazy. Even crazier, dozens of other black towns have been erased off the American map, not by burning them down, but by hiding them underwater. Don't know what I mean? Well, let's find out in a segment called, How Did We Get Here? This is Lake Lanier. It's a lake in Forsyth County, Georgia, where people go swimming and boating and fishing and do a bunch of other lakey things. But before it was Lake Lanier, it was a town called Oscarville, Georgia. Now, Oscarville was a thriving, predominantly black community with a church, a school, and dozens of homes until the year 1912 when a very bad thing happened. Oh, two very bad things. In 1912, two black teenagers were accused of rape. They were tried, convicted, and sentenced to death in a single day. And after they were executed, a mob of white men terrorized, drove out, or killed all the black people in the surrounding area. And they did that until the entire black community of Oscarville disappeared. The county went from having over 1,000 black residents in 1912 to zero in 1920. That story is so sad, it makes this story look like a comedy. After the black community had been run off, the white people of Forsyth County said, you know what we could use? A big old lake. So they made one, right where the town of Oscarville had just been. They flooded the area and literally covered up the entire town with water. This is what it looks like right now. But the town is still under there. The homes and churches and schools, they're still down there. And now people go boating on top of them. Compared to that, this is truly a rom-com. Now, you might be thinking, what a weird isolated incident. But just like the rat who ate the pizza in the subway, this story is both crazy and common. Ever heard of Collegia, Alabama? It was once a thriving black community with a black college, the first black railroad, and literally hundreds of family homes. Today, it's Lake Martin. At least they had the decency to name it after a black person. And if you think this kind of thing only happened in the South, let me introduce you to a place called Central Park. It's named after that coffee shop on Friends. Central Park used to have a black community in it called York Hill. But the city of New York destroyed York Hill so that they could build the Central Park Reservoir. Because if there's one thing New York needs, it's another place for ducks to hang out. But if you come here, don't try and feed those ducks. They are very aggressive. Mess around and lose a finger. Now, when the residents of York Hill were kicked out of their homes, they fled to another black community nearby called Seneca Village. And then a few years later, New York destroyed Seneca Village too so that they could build Central Park on top of it. The craziest part of this story is that I work a few blocks away from a place where the government disappeared two black communities. And until recently, I didn't know about any of it. You know why? Because it worked. They tried to erase black communities and they came way too close. But now there are people doing the research. So we are finally learning about places like Henry and McKee Islands, which is now located under Lake Guntersville in Alabama and Vanport, Oregon, which is now located under Delta Park. And all of these towns, which are currently literally underwater. Hey, wait, hold on. What was that last one? Old Neversink. That's a real place. Well, if we've learned one thing today, it's never assume something is unsinkable. There are over 100 drowned American towns, and many were destroyed in the name of something called development-induced displacement. That's when people have to leave their homes so the government can develop things like dams or parks or lakes. This happens to both white and black people, but historically when it happens, black people and other people of color are undercompensated for their property or not compensated at all. The theory is that the short-term bad effects are worth the long-term benefits for the community. But it's not fair if the long-term gain is mostly for white people. Now, luckily, there's a solution. It's a very complicated system. It involves a series of, ah, who am I kidding? Cut some dang checks. That's it. If you're going to kick black people out of their homes, make sure they have the money to stay on their feet. 
cut a dang check. And yes, you can pay their descendants too because generational wealth is one of the many things that is destroyed when you put black communities underwater. So cut a dang check. These drowned towns are part of the black American history they don't want to teach you. It's ugly and it's gross and we don't even know all of it. And the more we find out, the harder it is to love this place that would do those things to so many people. And if you're feeling this way, which I often do, you can try loving what this country could become instead. Our history may be full of pain, but our future has limitless possibilities. So look to the future while simultaneously being suspicious of every lake you see. When you think of the term welfare queen, you might picture someone like this. But I would like to invite you to the possibility that an actual welfare queen looks like this. Now, don't know what I mean? Let me explain in a segment called, How Did We Get Here? In the United States, a lot of people don't like welfare. They think that people who receive welfare are benefiting disproportionately from the money we all pool together as a society to help those in need. And many Americans have the idea that most of the people unfairly receiving that help are people of color, but are they? Let's go back to 1954. It's the year of Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka, and equally important, the year peanut M&Ms were invented. <laughs> now, Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka was not a versus battle between James Brown and a bunch of Kansas school teachers, although that would be great, and I would watch the butt off of it. Brown versus Board of Education was actually five civil rights cases all put together. One of them involved the South Carolina school district that only provided school buses for their white students. The black students has, had to cross a river and walk up to 16 miles to and from school. It's like if a triathlon was swimming, running, and algebra too. And <laughs> instead of meadows, you gotta get up and do it again the next day. But here's the important part. It's not just that the education for black kids was unequal. That particular school district was 75% black. So that means black parents' tax dollars were literally being used to build better lives for the white kids. Now, you might call that a unique distribution of funds, but I call it welfare for white people because the white kids were disproportionately benefiting from the money that was raised to take care of everyone. Now, in Brown versus Board of Education, the Supreme Court ruled that segregation in public schools was illegal, but that didn't stop white parents from getting their kids more government handouts. One public, once public schools couldn't be segregated anymore, a lot of white parents started opening private, all-white schools called segregation academies, which is the most on-the-nose name I have ever heard. <laughs> you might as well have called it racist prep. I mean, segregation academy? Go ahead and call it on the ones and threes elementary. <laughs> but the crazy thing about segregation academies, aside from the name, is that almost 200 of those schools still exist today. Segregation academies are one of those things that should have disappeared decades ago, but somehow didn't, like low-rise jeans or Bill Maher. <laughs> Or Bill Maher. <laughs> and here's the thing, white students are now the minority in public schools. It makes sense. Less than half of the US population under 18 is Caucasian, but private schools are still very white. Like naming your kid Braden White or <laughs> pronouncing Target Target White. <laughs> like dancing like this white. Like, what is that? What, what are you doing? Are you feeling a smell? What is this? As of 2017, 67% of private school students were white. That's two thirds. In a nation as diverse as ours, our private schools somehow have the same racial makeup as the triplets on This Is Us. <laughs> now, I know what you're thinking. Shouldn't parents be free to send their school, send their kids to any school that they can afford? Yes, of course they should. But here's the thing no one mentions. You and I are paying for those schools. In 23 states, your tax dollars are being used to send kids to private and religious schools. In Florida alone, residents pay almost $1 billion a year to send kids to private schools. To put that in perspective, that's slightly more than Florida spends on illegal fireworks and just a touch less than their meth budget. So 
now we know where to find America's white kids. They're in private school. Meanwhile, 70% 70, 70 of our black children are going to high poverty public schools while their parents' taxes are being used to fund majority white private schools. Now, what rubs many white Americans wrong about welfare is the idea that they pay a bunch of money in taxes and then someone else benefits. Meanwhile, black parents are paying taxes so that their kids can go to the school from Lean On Me, while a lot of white kids can go to the school from Dead Poets Society. <laughs> I'm just taking other people's word there. There's no way I can sit through that movie. But <laughs> let's be clear. I'm sure it's great, but let's be clear. The problem isn't just the private schools. No, these welfare kings and queens have also found a way to make their public schools whiter through a move called succession. Secession. Through a move called secession. Succession is something else. It's a great TV show. It's through a move called secession. And if that word has negative connotations for you, that is because you are a human being with a memory. <laughs> secession happens when part of a school district decides to leave the whole. In practice, it's when white people in a district decide they want their own school system. So they create a new one, leaving behind the students of color. The term secession sounds old timey and historical, but it's something that's actually happening right now. From 2000 to 2017, 47 school districts in the U.S. seceded from larger school districts, and every single one of those new districts is majority white. Basically, the concept of secession is a lot like the TV show Succession. And by that, I mean it's a bunch of greedy white nonsense. So here's the question. If Welfare is a small group of people unfairly draining money from the taxes that are collected from everyone. Then when it comes to education, who's actually receiving welfare? Hmm. And who's paying for that welfare? You and I are. And if you're not happy about that, go to your local school board meeting and speak up. But when you walk into that meeting, watch out for welfare queens. No, not her. Him! According to a certain kind of person, the kind who would rather have guns in schools than black history, America's problems boil down to one thing, undocumented immigrants. At least that's what I call them. Conservatives call them illegal aliens, which is an offensive term. And in 1607, real Americans called them, who the hell are all these white people and why don't they season their Thanksgiving dinner? <laughs> Now, when people rant about immigration, they're usually making one of three complaints. First, they say there are too many immigrants. Next, they'll call them criminals. And finally, they'll say they're stealing our elections. The only people more demonized than undocumented immigrants are people who emerged from the pandemic totally jacked. <laughs> we had an agreement that involved wine and soft pants. You betrayed me, Donna. <laughs> But what if none of these things are true? Let's start with the first one. There's too many of them. Well, people are worried that America will be overrun with immigrants and we don't have enough resources to deal with them, which sounds reasonable. But what if I told you that the number of unauthorized immigrants in the U.S. has declined since 2007? It's true. Undocumented immigrants have been decreasing for over a decade, much like the number of people doing parkour or the age of Leonardo DiCaprio's girlfriends. <laughs> now, I know what you're thinking. But what about all that footage of immigrant caravans coming to the border? Were they just a soul train line? <laughs> First of all, I wish, and yes, some people are immigrating here from other countries illegally, but people are also crossing the border in the opposite direction. That is how borders work. And for years, more immigrants have been leaving America than coming in. So technically, it's immigrants who solved our immigration problem. It's like, if you found out that the hamburglar was sneaking into McDonald's every night and leaving a bunch of hamburgers. <laughs> now, let's move on to the next concern, that undocumented immigrants are drug smugglers, terrorists, or criminals. Now, I group these three together because they're all equal parts bullshit. First, <laughs> the vast majority of drug traffickers are U.S. citizens. The drug trade, much like a combination Taco Bell, Pizza Hut, KFC, is ridiculously American. And <laughs> While there definitely are Mexican drug cartels, they're using way more sophisticated methods than asking people to frickin' jog across the border. Recent investigations show that they've used planes, 
drones, and even an underground rail system with solar-powered lighting. They have a solar-powered subway. Meaning, <laughs> meanwhile, in New York City, we got this. <laughs> We'd be lucky to get a Mexican drug cartel in here. Maybe they can get the F train to run on time. <laughs> Undocumented immigrants also aren't terrorists. In fact, Trump's own State Department said there's no credible information that any member of a terrorist group has traveled through Mexico to gain access to the United States. Zero terrorists. That is the smallest number you can have. <laughs> Even Back to the Future had a couple of terrorists, and that's just a movie about not making out with your own mom. <laughs> So immigrants aren't drug kingpins or terrorists, but how many of them commit regular crimes? Well, I've said before that crime is related to education and economics, not race or ethnicity, but there's one group that totally defies that research. Do you know who? Juggalos. I'm kidding. <laughs> it's undocumented immigrants. Because undocumented immigrants have considerably lower crime rates than native-born citizens. Basically, it goes, Undocumented immigrants, American citizens, and then any famous person who appears in the first 10 minutes of Law and Order. <laughs> like, you know, if Mark Ruffalo is playing the mailman, girl, he did it. <laughs> but it gets better because immigrants don't just not commit crimes, they actually make neighborhoods safer. One study found a reduction of almost five violent crimes for every 1% increase in the foreign born population. So if you want to improve your neighborhood, don't add three coffee shops and an overpriced cheese store, add immigrants. So that just leaves the final question. Are undocumented immigrants stealing elections? The short answer, no. The long answer, hell no. So why do people think they are? Well, in 2014, in 2014 a group called the Cooperative Congressional Election Study conducted a survey about voting. Now, at the bottom was a box that asked people if they were American citizens. The surveyors knew that, inevitably, a few people would check the wrong box, and that's what happened. They got a small number of voters who checked the box saying they weren't citizens. Now, what's more likely? That a few people checked the wrong box or that they decided to use a random survey to confess to a felony? <laughs> Either way, Conservatives used that very small number to declare that this study meant that millions of people voted illegally in 2008. And that same misinformation has been repeated ad nauseum to say the 2020 election was stolen as well. But just for fun, want to know how many confirmed illegal votes they actually found in that original 2014 survey? Five. Yeah. Much like a guy in a locker room telling people how many women he's had sex with, the Republicans took the number five and pretended it was millions. <laughs> So, to summarize, numbers of undocumented immigrants have been decreasing for years. Immigrants aren't criminals, and they aren't stealing elections. More importantly, these false accusations say a lot more about white people's fears of people that don't look like them than they do about immigrants. But pretending that those fears constitute a national crisis? Well, much like a Taco Bell Pizza Hut KFC, that couldn't be more American. When many Americans hear the word reparations, they think of it as a monetary compensation for the emotional impact of slavery. Kind of like a check with I'm sorry written in the memo. But that's not what reparations are because there is no amount of money you could pay that would make up for enslaving people. The actual purpose of reparations is to restore the physical and financial things that were stolen from black Americans as a result of slavery. There are lots of examples of this, but let's just explore one, housing. And to do that, let's go back to the year 1865. That's when bicycles looked like this and Paul Rudd looked like this. <laughs> Right before the Civil War ended, President Lincoln's top general met with a group of black ministers to ask how the government could help the formerly enslaved be successful in America. They said, give us some land we can live on. And the general said, no problem. We have a bunch we just stole from Native Americans. <laughs> the general issued Special Field Order Number 15, which confiscated Confederate land and gave it back to black people. The government promised every formerly enslaved black family 40 acres and a mule, which is very practical. Personally, I would have asked for 40 acres and a hippopotamus, just to mess with them. <laughs> Unfortunately, 
What the government didn't promise was no take backsies. Because after Lincoln's assassination, President Andrew Johnson rescinded the order and left those black families without a place to live. Because just like a dental patient swearing they're gonna start flossing, the U.S. loves to go back on a promise. <laughs> now, let's skip ahead to the 1930s and 40s. That's when cars looked like this and Paul Rudd looked like this. <laughs> At that time, black Americans were being terrorized in the South, so millions of them migrated North. But many Northerners refused to rent or sell homes to them. So black families did what they've done for generations. They made something out of nothing. They created makeshift communities and alleyways in cities like Washington, D.C. And then Congress came along and created something called the Alleyway Dwelling Authority. They cited the eighth article of the Constitution, which is, if things are going okay for black people, it's time to f it up. The Alleyway Dwelling Authority said, we love what you've done with the place, but we want to make it safe for you. Why don't you move out and let us fix it up for you? But when they did, they put those houses up for sale at prices so high, black families couldn't afford to move back. So they were left, once again, without a place to live. Now, usually when something that bad happens to black people, it's because somebody said the word Candyman five times. <laughs> Hold on, did that count as one of my times? I take it back. Now, the history of kicking black people out of their homes isn't limited to big cities. Let's look at a town in Maryland called Frostburg. In 1866, two black women purchased land there that no one else wanted, and with it, they created Brownsville, a community of freed black people. They built a school and a flourishing community of businesses and homes owned by black people. I think you know where this is going. The local white people saw what could be done on that land, and they decided they wanted a school too. And you guessed it, they built it right on top of Brownsville. They spent the next couple of decades pushing black residents out of their homes so that they could build a college. In fact, members of the community were forced to sell their houses for $10. $10 for a house is insane. Even Monopoly houses cost 50. <laughs> the only house that should cost $10 is this one. And even then, you're underpaying. It's adorable. So what used to be Brownsville is now Frostburg State University, whose mascot is, I'm guessing, the sneaky land thieves? And the university left the residents of Brownsville and their descendants without a place to live. Which brings us back to reparations. Reparations aren't just about putting a monetary value on the harm of enslavement. They're about restoring to black Americans the tangible things that were stolen from them through Jim Crow laws, housing discrimination, and so many other living, breathing legacies to enslavement. And there is no limit to what these reparations can look like. Maybe it's direct payments. Maybe it's housing subsidies. Maybe it's buying 17 copies of the book I wrote with my sister Lacey. I'm just spitballing here. I don't know. But whatever we do, it's time to do something. That bill I mentioned earlier, H.R. 40, it was written in 1989 and has been introduced in every session of Congress since, which means it's 32 years old. That's right, they've been trying to pass this bill for an entire Daniel Kaluuya. <laughs> Let's pass it already so our country can become something better than it has been for the past 400 years, because if we don't, well then, America, much like this guy's face, might just stay exactly like this forever. This has been How Do We Get Here? There are a few things that every American high school student can count on experiencing. Algebra, acne, and filling in tiny bubbles. But standardized testing wasn't always a part of American education. In fact, just like your favorite thrift store jacket, standardized testing started out in the military. In 1917, a group of psychologists created an entrance exam for the U.S. Army. It was given to new recruits, and the purpose was to separate those who were mentally superior from those who were mentally inferior. Kind of like what you do when you look at Tinder, Tinder profiles. <laughs> I know, I'm not looking, I'm not looking at Tinder. All right. You tell me, probably. A few years later, a psychologist named Carl Brigham, seen here right after becoming haunted, published a study analyzing the results of those tests. He announced that black people had scored the lowest. He claimed American education was declining and he blamed that on the intermixing of black and white people. He said, the decline of American intelligence will be more rapid than the decline of the intelligence of European national groups 
owing to the presence here of the Negro. What I'm saying is he sounds like a really fun guy. <laughs> now, I guess it is possible that black recruits actually did worse on that man's made up test, but here's the thing. When a bunch of white people design a test around the things they know, then they are by definition designing a test that white people will do better on because every test is biased toward the people who create it. If Sir Mix-a-Lot creates a test about which types of butts are best, you know the answer is gonna be big. <laughs> Our haunted friend Carl here created a biased test. But when he said that his test proved that black people were inferior, white people were ready to listen. And when immigrants started showing up in the U.S. in greater numbers in the early 1900s, the people in charge of immigration got a great idea. They decided to use these new intelligence tests to choose who could enter the U.S. and who couldn't. Sort of like a racist bouncer. They were used to prove that non-white people were at the lower end of the racial, ethnic, and cultural spectrum. And they weren't just written in a biased way, they were also written in English, which many immigrants didn't speak fluently. Can you imagine trying to take a test in English when you don't speak English? That's like me trying to watch a telenovela. I don't understand what's happening. I just understand that the stakes are very high. As these intelligence tests became more widespread, white supremacists started using them for more than just the military or immigration. They started using them as a scientific sounding way to justify segregation. And even as a way to justify forced sterilization of people of color and people who were intellectually disabled. Now that is a very heavy piece of information. So let's just take a moment and reset with a picture of two animals hugging. There we go. All right, you fell for it. Now, <laughs> what does all of this have to do with the SATs? Well, at the height of the Jim Crow era, white schools were looking for new and exciting ways to keep black students out. And in the 1920s, they said, oh, you know who we should call? Haunted Carl. <laughs> America's College Board asked Carl to create something called the Scholastic Aptitude Test, or the SAT, that they could use to eliminate undesirable applicants. And Carl said, stand back. I've been training for this my whole life. <laughs> Harvard was the first school to require all students to take the SAT, so I don't know how to break this to you, but... <laughs> Some racist stuff happened at Harvard! <laughs> The test was such a hit, other colleges started using it, and by the mid-1900s, standardized testing was widespread, creating an even larger disparity in access to education. These tests became a barrier to knowledge and generational wealth for many American families of color, because that was precisely what it was designed to do. For instance, SAT designers used old test questions to design questions for next year's exam. Old questions were deemed good questions if Latin, black and Latinx students scored lower than their white peers. So if white students did well on a question, it would be moved to the new test, centering the test around their knowledge base. Basically, the old test was right in the new test, like this. See, there you go. <laughs> and I'm not just talking about how they made the test in olden times. On the October 1998 SAT, white students scored higher than black students on every single one of the 138 questions. Every single one. They could have saved some time and just had one question. Are you white? Yes, you get a 1600. Now, many people have asked, how can we make a test that is more accessible to students of different racial and ethnic backgrounds? But as we send our kids back to school this month, maybe the question is, why are we using standardized tests at all? Because the goal of these tests was never education. It was always exclusion. And that fact is haunting, which I guess explains Carl's face. This has been How Did We Get Here?